Okay, so let's do this. Grab your piece of paper and let's. Hello and welcome to MK's Exam Secrets. My name is Dr. Moses Kazevu. This is a series on my YouTube channel where we look at exam questions in a clinical course. This is season two, episode five, and we're going to be covering surgery today. If you haven't yet subscribed to the channel, please hit the subscribe button, hit the bell notification icon to be receiving notifications of such videos every time I post. Grab your piece of paper, grab your pen, and let's go. Beginning with our question one, remember the rules of these videos. You may pause the video at any point to screen the answer at your screen or write it down in a piece of paper. So what does this have to say? So question one, write short notes on flail chest. B, write short notes on management of chronic osteomyelitis. So you may pause the video at any point. So here comes the answer. So remember that with the flail chest, this is pretty much a life-threatening medical condition that's going to be occurring where you have two or more consecutive ribs that are fractured in two or more places. So you have a segment of the uh, rib cage that's actually detached from the ribs, such that this flail segment is going to be compromising the breathing of an individual, and this fractured segment moves in a paradoxical manner, meaning that when the chest is expanding, the segment goes inwards. When the chest is deflating, then the uh, segment goes outwards. Then remember that the segment moves inwards rather than outwards, hence impeding ventilation of the ipsilateral lung. Then of course, this is accompanied by um, pulmonary contusion, which is a bruise of the lung that can actually interfere with the blood oxygenation. Now, most likely this is going to be caused by trauma, especially in patients that are involved in road traffic accidents. Clinical features may include things like chest pains, shortness of breath, and paradoxical breathing or paradoxical respiration. Then, of course, diagnosis is mainly clinical. You may do a, a plain x-ray or a CT scan, which may actually show you the fractured uh, ribs. And, of course, management is analgesia. You may strap the flail segment as a first aid. Then, of course, positive pressure ventilation, but ultimately, chest tube may be required if there is an associated hemothorax or pneumothorax or even hemoneumothorax. Then, of course, chest physiotherapy. And of course, complications include the pneumothorax as well as respiratory failure. And remember that in the management of chronic osteomyelitis, pretty much the mainstay management is surgery. So you, depending on the indication, you may perform extensive debridement of all necrotic and granulation tissue along with reconstruction of the bone and the soft tissue defects. If there's any abscess, you may perform open drainage of the abscess or sequestrectomy to remove the dead bone. And of course, amputation may sometimes be indicated in cases of chronic osteomyelitis. You want to cover them on broad spectrum antibiotics for at least 12 weeks. Then of course, temporal placement of uh, polymethyl uh, methacrylate beads can be done in the wounds. Then these can act as a depot for administration of antibiotics. And moving on to the second question, with aid of diagrams, discuss Salter Harry's classification of epiphyseal fractures. With aid of diagrams, describe Salter Harry's classification of epiphyseal fractures. And here comes the answer. So remember that this classification was first discovered or was first described in 1963 by Salter and Harris. And they described predominantly four types, but a fifth type was actually added to the types of epiphyseal fractures. So we can actually use the word Salter to help us remember the different types of fractures. S for straight through, that's for type one. A for above, that's for type two, which is the commonest cause. Um, L for lower, meaning type 3, then T, E, meaning for through everything, which is type 4, and then the R, you can remember the rammed or crushed. So with your type 1, you have 5% uh, of the patients having this type of a fracture. So this is a fracture that's going to be involving a transverse fracture through the hypertrophic or calcific zone of the epiphyseal plate. I'll show you the diagrams in the next slide. And of course, the second most common is the type 2 which accounts for 75%. This is the commonest type. Now, of course, the fracture is going to be involving the growth plate. So it's going to be extending into the metaphysis above or away from the joint, but it spares the epiphysis. 
then of course the fracture can sometimes split off a triangular segment which is referred to as a thurston holland segment so you have this triangular metaphysial fracture fragment of the bone which is referred to as a thurston holland fragment then of course type 3 you have the lower so this is accounting for 10% of the cases. The fracture is going to be involving the growth plate and the epiphyseal uh, plate below the joint, but it spares the metaphysis. Then through everything type four, this is accounting for 10%. Also the fracture involves the growth plate, the metaphysis, the epiphysis. So this forms a T, the fracture forms a T. So you can remember the T and through everything that the, it's going to be forming a T. I'll, I'll show you what this looks like in the um, image very shortly. Then of course, Type 5 is rammed or crushed. This accounts for 1%. So this is the least common. And this is obviously due to longitudinal compression injuries of the epiphyseal plate. There may be no visible fracture. But of course, this is more of like a retrospe retrospective diagnosis when there is growth arrest in the individual. So here are the different types. So this is a normal bone here. And then here you have your type 1 where the fracture is happening through uh, the fracture separates the uh, epiphysis. So usually this occurs in infants, but it can also occur at puberty as uh, a slipped femoral um, epiphysis. So you have the fracture through here, the epiphyseal plate. Then of course you have your type 2 over here at the bottom of the screen. As you can see, the fracture is going through the, uh, the physis. It's also going and extending to the metaphysis and it spares this uh, aspect here. So it's going above the joint. So of course this occurs in older children and it rarely results in any abnormal growth. Then on this other hand, you have the type three over here. The type three is going into the um, physis and then it's going and spreading towards the epiphysis. So the epiphysis is affected here. And this segment here that is um, of course peeled off, this is what we, we, oh, sorry. This is what we refer to as a Thurston Holland segment, which is on the type two. So you have this segment here, which is peeled off over there. Then of course your type four, is of course splitting the physis, the epiphysis, and the damaged articular surface. And this may actually cause abnormal type of growth, uh, as you can see over here. So it's going to be affecting more or less making a T. So it's going to be coming, there may be a fracture that's extending here, there may be another fracture that's extending there, kind of like forming a T. Though this may not be characteristically like a T here, but imagine it, that it's, it's actually forming a T. Then of course the crush, the physis may actually look normal, but then ultimately there is going to be a decrease in the growth of this individual. Moving on to question three, write short notes on examination of a patient with ulcer, abdominal pain, and breast lump. So this, this actually is a very simple question, but very simple, but yet at the same time, very dangerous because you may lose track of what you are examining. You may lose track of what is expected of you. Okay. So here comes the answer. So I shall discuss them in three sections. Ulcers, I'll discuss them on your own. Abdominal pain, I'll discuss it on its own. And a breast lump, I'll discuss it on its own. So beginning with an, uh, an ulcer. So remember that for any examination, you greet the patient, introduce yourself, explain the examination that you're about to undertake, and gain consent, informed consent. Then, of course, position the patient in bed in anatomical position. Make sure that the ulcer is exposed. Then from the foot end of the bed and the right side of the bed, perform a general examination. What are you going to be doing on your general examination? So your general condition of the patient. Is it good, poor, uh, or fair? Your nutritional status of this person. Is it good, uh, poor, or fair? The, is the presence of any pallor, jaundice, cyanosis, finger clubbing, lymphadenopathy? Check for the vitals. The temperature, pulse, blood pressure, respiratory rate, and oxygen saturation. And then you come now and perform your local examination of the ulcer. So you want to perform ins inspection, the site of the ulcer in relation to any bony prominences in relation to the anatomical location, the number of ulcers, whether they're single or multiple, the shape, some have a regular shape, some have an irregular shape, the size, some are quite large. We usually uh, compare these to different everyday objects like the size of a tennis ball or whatever. And of course, the depth of the ulcer, is it superficial? Is it uh, deep? The margins, are the margins sloping? Are they irregular? Are they regular? Are they everted? Are they undermined? And all these mean different things. Of course, the edge of the ulcer, the, um, there are different edge, edges. Then, of course, the flow and a presence or absence of any discharge in the surrounding skin. How is the surrounding skin looking like? Is it hyper? Is it hyperpigmented? Is it hypopigmented? And of course, you palpate for any tenderness at the edge, the base, the surrounding areas. You palpate for any warmth. You palpate the edge. You also palpate the base for any induration 
or mod as well as mobility, the depth of the ulcer if it bleeds to touch. You also palpate the surrounding skin, palpate the peripheral pulses and the regional lymph nodes of that ulcer. And then of course, do not forget to auscultate the peripheral arteries for any bruise. And of course, thank the patient after that. Then when it comes to examination of abdominal pain, the same preliminaries. You greet your patient, introduce yourself, explain the examination that you're going to undertake, gain consent, position the patient in bed in an anatomical position, adequate exposure. So exposure is adequately from the nipple to halfway through the thigh, but because of modesty's sake, sometimes we expose up until the pubis. Then from the foot end of the bed, as well as the right side of the bed, perform your general examination. So your general condition, is it good, fair, poor? The if there's any pallor, jaundice, cyanosis, finger clubbing, lymphadenopathy, check for your vitals, your temperature, pulse, blood pressure, your respiratory rate, and your oxygen saturation. Then, of course, when you come to the abdominal examination, of course, there is also a general examination for the abdominal examination where you check the palms for certain signs like Duke Trains contractures, any uh, leukonychia, any coilonychia, and, of course, any palm erythema. Then... On inspection, you inspect the abdomen for any scars, markings, masses. You check the abdominal contours. You, you comment on the abdominal contours and the abdominal distension. And remember, you should be at the level of the abdomen. And of course, for any flank fullness, any symmetry, and as of course, is it moving with respiration? And you ask the patient to cough and observe their facial expression. So you check for the cough and impulse. And of course, you palpate. There is light palpation, which checks for tenderness, guarding, and mass masses. And of course, deep palpation, which also checks for tenderness, masses, and organomegaly. So you palpate the liver and the liver edge. You also palpate the spleen. You balance the kidneys. You palpate the abdominal aorta to rule out any presence of any aneurysms. And then, of course, you also check for rebound tenderness. If there is any mass that is present, you should note the size, the shape, and consistency. Then, of course, when you percuss, percuss all the quadrants. And remember that you're supposed to start with a quadrant where there is no pain. And the quadrant where there is pain should be your last quadrant to percuss, even with palpation. Then, of course, you check for any shifting downness or fluid through. You auscultate for the bowel sound quality and quantity, as well as listen to the renal artery for any renal bruise. Examine the groin, the genitals, and hernia orifices, and do not forget to perform a rectal examination, where you check for the anal tone, the blood, and the masses, as well as the prostate enlargement in terms of males. Then, of course, thank the patient and cover them up. When it comes to examination of a breast lump, the preliminaries always remain the same. So greet your patient, introduce yourself, explain the examination you're about to undertake and gain consent, position the patient in, in, in bed in anatomical position, expose the patient. And of course, from the foot end of the bed as well as the right side, perform a general examination, looking out for the general condition, the pallor, jaundice, cyanosis, finger clubbing, lymphadenopathy, vitals, just like we did with the other examinations, then you come to your local examination. So now before you perform your local examination, ask the patient first which breast has any lumps or which breast is painful or which breast has any discharge. And do not forget that this breast is the one that should be examined last. Then when you examine the patient, you first do inspection. There are some maneuvers that you should inspect for. So one maneuver is first of all, the patient is going to be seated uh, by the edge of the bed and they are going to be seated upright with the arms on the thigh at first, then the arms pressed around the hips. Then again, they are also pushed inwards. And then finally, with the arms over the head and while they are leaning forward. And of course, when they are doing these things, these certain maneuvers, you're going to be inspecting for the breast contours, the breast symmetry or asymmetry, any scars, any markings, any obvious masses, any swelling, any skin changes like erythema and peau d'orange. Then of course, any ulcerations, any dimpling, any uh, nipple contours, any nipple retraction, nipple ulceration, or any nipple discharge. Then, of course, you come to palpation where you vary the pressures as light, medium, and deep palpation, and you palpate all four quadrants, starting with the quadrant that has the least pain. Then, of course, you can move quadrant by quadrant, or you can move in concentric circles around the breast. And then do not also forget to palpate the axillary tail of the breast. So you're going to be noting for the consistency. You're going to be noting for the tenderness. And any if there is any lump, note the position, the size, the shape, the consistency, the fluctuation, mobility, as well as the overlying skin. Then, of course, palpate the nipple and express any discharge. Do not also forget to palpate the axillary lymph nodes. Then, of course, thank the patient and cover them up. Moving on to question four, answer the following questions. Define surgical jaundice, list important etiological factors, discuss brief relative investigations. So you may pause the video at any point starting from now. And here comes the answer. So remember that jaundice, pretty much surgical jaundice, which is also referred to as cholestatic jaundice, which is also referred to as conjugated hyperbilirubinemia, 
which is also referred to as obstructive jaundice, is pretty much yellowing of the skin and mucous membranes that develops due to biliary obstruction, which may be partial, complete, or incomplete, and causes conjugated hyperbilirubinemia with a value that's greater than 2.5 milligrams per deciliter or greater than 40 micromoles per liter. It's very important to remember these values. And of course, the common etiological factors or the important etiological factors can be classified as intramural, meaning the obstruction is within the lumen, mural, meaning the obstruction is within the wall, or extramural, meaning the obstruction is outside the wall. So intraluminal obstructions include common bowel duct stones, biliary strictures, pancreatic strictures, which are often due to chronic pancreatitis, parasitic infections, biliary atresia, and as well as a clad skin tumor. Now, of course, mural causes include cholangiocarcinomas, ascending cholangitis, sclerosing cholangitis, as well as cholidocosis. Extramural causes include a carcinoma of the head of the pancreas, as well as the periampillary region of the pancreas, as well as you may have extrinsic compression of the common bowel duct due to a lymph node or even other tumors. The investigations ordered for patients that have obstructive jaundice include blood investigations, which include liver function tests where you check for the serum bilirubin. And remember that you're going to be measuring the direct as well as the total bilirubin. And if the total, the direct bilirubin is more than 20% of the total bilirubin, then this is highly suggestive of obstructive jaundice or surgical jaundice. We want to check for the prothrombin time, which may sometimes be uh, four times the uh, greater than the control. You want to check for the liver and hepatobiliary enzymes. Notice how liver function tests are not liver enzymes. You want to check for the liver and hepatobiliary enzymes, the five uh, prime nucleotides, which is actually the most reliable type because it's not affected by any other pathologies. For example, with ALP and these other enzymes, they may be affected by bone pathologies. They may be affected by alcohol. So this tends to be elevated. You also check for your gamma glutamyl transferase, which is elevated. ALP is also tends to be elevated. The normal is 3 to 12, and it actually can be greater than 30 in obstructive jaundice. And of course, AST and ALT may minimally or sometimes be um, not even elevated. Their normal is less than 35 uh, units, international units per liter. Then, of course, your full blood count may show neutrophilia in cases of inflammatory conditions. Then, of course, tumor markers like a CA19-9, where it will be greater than 70 units per liter in, if a patient has a carcinoma of the pancreas. And of course, alpha fetoprotein may be elevated in cases of hepatocellular carcinomas. And of course, you want to order, also order for some imaging, abdominal ultrasound that may show gallstones, endoscopic retrograde cholangial pancreatography to actually visualize the site of obstruction, to uh, perform a brush biopsy or even a bowel sample analysis. And then it can also be used as a both diagnostic and therapeutic modality. And then, of course, you also want to visualize the obstruction and the anatomical relations. You may perform uh, or use a magnetic resonance cholangiopancreatography. You may also perform a CT scan. Percutaneous transhepatic cholangiography uh, can be done to decompress as well as assess for proximal uh, dilated obstructed uh, biliary system if, of course, your ERCP fails. Then, of course, endoscopic um, ultrasound may also be done as this can assess the uh, pancreatic masses, it can stage the disease, and it can also identify important portal venous system as well as common bowel duct stones. And of course, on the urine, you may perform a urine analysis. Of course, your urine will be dark and may show the presence of conjugated bilirubin. Moving on to our last question, it's never a surgery exam if you don't have a Burns question. So a 10-year-old child weighing 30 kg is admitted with 20% burns, discuss initial management or initial assessment rather, calculate fluids requirement deficit and maintenance using Packland formula. So here comes the answer. So remember that when you're assessing for burns, pretty much you want to assess the airway, breathing, circulation, disability and exposure, prevent any hypothermia, then of course stop any burning processes and there is a need for fluid resuscitation. Assess for the need for fluid resuscitation. Assess for the severity of, of burns. How do we do this? We assess the affected body surface area. We can use the rule of nines, the rule of sevens, or the rule of palms. We can also use the London Broder charts, which are actually the most accurate. Then also assess for the depth of the burns, whether they're superficial burns or they're deep burns. Assess the level of consciousness using either your AVPU or your Glasgow Coma Scale. If it's a child, you may use your Blunt Coma Scale. And this time, it's, I think it's a child. So you can still use a Glasgow Coma Scale because a 10-year-old can speak. Then, of course, assess the time and the burn, assess the time of burn injury establish the cause and consider whether this was non-accidental. Then also ask, assess for any associated injuries, any um, things like sustained injuries when the victim was trying to escape the fire or the burn, any pre-existing uh, 
medical conditions, any drug therapy or any allergies, even allergies to drugs, and also ask for a tetanus immunization status. And of course, the fluid requirements in the Parkland formula, remember that the Parkland formula, the volume that of the fluid that you're going to be giving in the first 24 hours as resuscitation is four mils multiplied by the body weight, multiplied by the percentage uh, estimation. This time we have four meals. The patient had 20% burns multiplied by 20 and they were weighing 30 kg. Sometimes they may not give you the weight of the child. So you can actually calculate the weight using the formula here. Two, uh, the weight is going to be equals to two times the age plus four. And then of course, this is going to give you 2,400. Remember that you're going to be giving half of this, which is 1,200 of Ringer's lactate in the first eight hours. And then the remainder is given in the next or in the remaining 16 hours after the child was burned, from the time the child was burned, not from the time when the child reported to the hospital. Then, of course, maintenance fluid, remember, 100 kg, 100 mils for the first 10 kg, 50 mils for the next 10 kg, and 20 mils for the remainder. So 10, 100 times 10, 50 times 10, 20 times 10, and you add them up. So it means that this person is going to re be receiving 1,700 mils on day two as part of maintenance fluid. I really hope you enjoyed this episode of surgery and how exactly you should be approaching these surgical questions and answering them on your surgery exams. If you did enjoy, please hit the subscribe button, hit the bell notification icon to be receiving notifications of such videos every time I post. Drop a like, drop a comment. My name is Dr. Moses.